Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to this um, session. Um, we have two very interesting and exciting presentations, um, and I will briefly introduce the speakers, presenters for these two presentations. So our first speaker is Professor Patrick Vogt from the University of Cape Town. And Professor Vogt is a professor of astronomy and head of the astronomy department at UCT and the past president of the South African Institute of Physics. His research focuses on the study of accretion processes and accretion induced outflows in stellar binaries using optical and radio telescope and he has co-authored uh, over 120 peer-reviewed papers. So Professor uh, Vogt's presentation is entitled Data Intensive Time Domain Astronomy with Meerkat and the SKA and in this talk he will give some examples of their experiences over the past two years in the analysis and astrophysical interpretation of large data sets and um, as these are on, on the LIFO research cloud. So it is my privilege and my pleasure to introduce Professor Patrick Quote on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anwar. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the introduction. Um, my talk, as, as was introduced, will talk about um, time domain intensive, data intensive astronomy with Meerkat and the SKA. And um, I'm also the lead of a large survey project on Meerkat, the Thundercat project, which speaks to this. So today I will talk about the experiences that we've had over the last two years in working with the Meerkat data in the IDEA ILIFU um, data center and looking particularly at the data products that we get out and extracting value from those data products. Um, so this is one of three talks on Meerkat in this particular conference. Uh, the only one in the, the research track and yesterday you heard Ian Haywood talk about the, uh, the work that he's done on the CHPC. Um, but I want to introduce Meerkat. Uh, if you didn't attend yesterday's talk, just a brief background on the Meerkat array. This is a precursor to the square kilometer array. And you can see in this picture here, the core of the Meerkat uh, array. So Meerkat consists of 64 antennas, um, each 13 and a half meter diameter, uh, the Gregorian offset and these um, antennas. And they're based over, um, they're located over an eight kilometer baseline near the town of Carnarvon in the Northern Cape. So this is a low density area where we're away from radio frequency interference. And this is an ideal location for a telescope like this. Um, this is a global science flagship project. Um, and the telescope itself was inaugurated in July 2018 by the deputy president of South Africa. Um, and since then, Meerkat science has been ongoing. For the last two years, uh, we've been working with the Meerkat array. And I'm going to share some of the results and our experiences and some of the challenges we experienced. Meerkat itself will then be extended with another 20 SKA antennas uh, over the next couple of years. This is called the Meerkat extended phase. And ultimately it will be incorporated in the square kilometer array, um, which will then contain 192 antennas over a baseline of about 150 kilometers. And the extended baseline basically adds uh, a higher resolution of the images that we get, um, bigger data of course as part of that, and the increase in antennas will give you a higher sensitivity. So this, this array will roll out to become the world's most sensitive radio telescope. Um, to place this into context of uh, this week's conference, um, I want to talk a little bit about the data rates and the data archiving and the data processing. And so I've illustrated this in this uh, particular flow diagram where you can see the net has um, telescope on the top left here, um, the data rates from Meerkat and ultimately the SKA uh, will be tremendous. So the data from the antenna to the correlators um, is of order terabits per second, many terabits per second. Uh, but during that process of 
combining the signals in the correlator, that data flow is reduced and, um, uh, tremendously. And when it gets ingested into the Meerkat archive at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, this array or archive, um, the data rates and the data volumes are more manageable. Yesterday, you could see, uh, you heard a talk by Ian on uh, reprocessing some of the Meerkat data on the Langdahl cluster of the CHPC. Um, but I, in this today, in today's talk, I want to focus on our work within the IDEA Ilifu um, data center. So basically, the data from the raw archive can be pulled to various HPCs. Um, and so I've given two examples here, the CHPC and the IDEA. Um, but eventually, in the model of the square kilometer array, there will be many data centers across the world in a federated uh, way. So we, we distribute these data then to um, the researchers working with it across the world in, in these environments. At IDEA and ILIFU, um, the science users, staff and students, and I want to emphasize the students, there are lots of students working on these data, um, come to the data. The data don't have to be users anymore, it's too large in volume. So the users come to the data in this environment. Um, and in there, we, we generate the images, the databases. Uh, for time domain astronomy, particularly, we, we work on transient alerts and the public release of data. So it's the environment highlighted in the, in the, in the box with IDEA and ILIFU that I'll talk about. So in this talk, we'll give our experience from the Meerkat Large Survey Project in time domain astronomy and working with the, this research cloud. And there's another talk today by Bradley Frank, who's the Associate Director for Astronomy Operations at IDEA, who will, will, will talk about the, um, the, the bigger implications of the many users that, that are using this system. From my perspective, I'm talking about time domain astronomy. And so for that, I need to introduce the science program of Meerkat. Um, Meerkat has defined a number of legacy style large survey projects, um, which for which it, um, to which it allocates two thirds of its observing time. This involves many hundreds of researchers in the various large survey projects. Um, the project I lead consists of about 100 people. Um, and many of the other surveys are similar numbers. So all in all, many hundreds of researchers are involved in, in this, these science projects. And I very much see this as a collaboration model for future SKA surveys. So once the telescope rolls out and uh, international partners join, the way we're working in these, these large survey projects is an excellent model for how South African researchers and students will be collaborating in broader SKA surveys. Um, in addition to the large legacy surveys, um, there's also a regular up time for open call uh, proposals. 28% uh, of the time will be allocated to that. The first call will happen last year. Um, 38 projects were approved, led by South African PIs. And in this year, a second call was um, announced and Currently, all the proposals are under review. In addition to that, there is a discretionary time component where the director can allocate time in, in rapid response to some unusual events. And finally, during the commissioning of, of the Meerkat Array, Sareo, the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, led a number of legacy style surveys, uh, once of surveys, uh, particularly of the Magellanic Clouds, of the Galactic Plain, and some galaxy clusters. So it's within this context of the large survey projects that I've been working with my colleague, uh, Rob Fender, who's the head of astrophysics in Oxford, um, and uh, 90 other researchers in this Thundercats team. Um, this is time domain astronomy with me um, The people working on this project are distributed across 15 countries, um, but the most, uh, the largest spectrum uh, per country comes from South Africa. The 20%, 27% of the people working on Thundercats are based in South Africa. Um, we have many postgraduate students, uh, MSc and PhD students, uh, and many students from the African SKA partner countries also involved in this. Uh, to give an example, one of the MSc students is doing an MSc at the University of Mauritius, uh, and he's accessing the data, Meerkat data, through the IDEA and ILIFU cloud. Um, so we have about 30 researchers making use of this facility for data processing and extracting value from, from the, the large data flow from the account. Um, and, and the way we operate is then when we have a project, uh, 
a new transient going off a stellar explosion or something, uh, we allocate a project to a student to work on that exclusively. So the 30 researchers that make use of this uh, very often are uh, starting MSc or PhD students. And, uh, so the environment has to be conducive for students to, to gain rapid experience with any of this. From an operational perspective, um, we require a rapid response to, to celestial events. We're looking at objects in the sky that vary on time scales of uh, minutes, uh, sometimes even as short as a few seconds, uh, minutes, hours, days. And so we have to be on sky quickly. And this adds a, a complexity in, in um, operating uh, the telescope. And it also adds an additional complexity in the data requirements because we want to see what goes on in, in these events uh, in real time. Um, so we have to do real time analysis, um, looking for these astrophysical transients, but we also wanna make sure that the data are processed in a uniform way, given that um, many different students work on different data sets. Once we publish a um, release, public release of data products, we wanna make sure that the data are processed in a uniform uh, way, and when we find new transients, um, we also want to make sure that those are reliable uh, detections. There's an additional complication in, in our way in the sense that astronomy doesn't restrict itself to a single wavelength regime or a single frequency regime. Ian in his talk yesterday showed the value of multi-wavelength astronomy, and particularly for astrophysical transients, we want to link this to the optical wavelength regime. And so in this picture that you see here, you see the telescopes of the South African Astronomical Observatory in Sutherland, also in the Northern Cape. And there's a whole range of telescopes, but there's one particular telescope, the Meerlich telescope, that is exclusively linked to Meerkat. So wherever Meerkat is looking, this telescope will look at the same field of view uh, and seeing, seeing what's happening in the optical wavelength regime rather than the radio. And this provides tremendous value, both to validate uh, radio transients that we discover, to characterize those objects, but also to trigger follow-up observations on, on many of the other telescopes that you can see here. The Southern African Large Telescope, for instance, the world's largest optical telescope, is, is located on this platform of telescopes. And we want to sometimes trigger follow-up spectroscopy as well. Uh, this is a project uh, across uh, a partnership between South Africa, the UK, and the Netherlands. And uh, Paul Schroed and I are the principal investigators of this. The data challenges then um, that I've outlined here generally apply to all the large survey projects and to some of the um, PI led projects as well in terms of the large data rates. And this will, of course, increase uh, exponentially towards the SKA. Um, the challenge of getting the data to the users, and, and that's not possible anymore, and certainly not in the SK era. So we have to get the users to the data. Um, but then particularly for time domain astronomy, the rapid turnaround from raw data to results, the science-driven uh, need for that is, is particular to, to the project that I'm working on, um, as well as the data fusion of multi multiple databases, optical and radio, all in real time. So the Meerlich data comes to the IDEA data center um, and the Meerkat data comes there as well. And we want to diffuse that information in real time to expect value from both the optical and the radio databases. Uh, I mentioned the uniformity of data processing as well. Uh, and this is particularly important in the way that Meerkat is operating. <coughs> um, so we, we have been allowed to search in all the large survey data for transients. And this is a new way of, of searching for uh, new and unusual objects. Uh, and it's called com commensal observing. So, so in all the large survey data, we can search for new transients, but this, this needs, uh, this requires that we, we understand all the data products coming in. And when we look for it, we compare apples with apples when we look at data from other surveys as well. And then the reliability of transients alerts. And uh, this is moving towards robotic uh, alerts where uh, machine algorithms issue triggers to other telescopes. And we want to make sure that the triggers that we release are of genuine astrophysical objects and not because of uh, false positives in, in the way we search for these transients. Um, okay, so I'm going to unpack some of these uh, challenges in a little bit more detail. 
um, and we mentioned the large data rates already. Um, and I'll, I'll show you here the flow of data from Meerkat through the Tsareo archive to Elifu. Um, this is not, it's large, but it's not manageable. Uh, we have data rates between 0.1 and 3 terabytes per hour coming off the data that we expect from the archive and that we're working with. And similarly, for Meerlift, um, we get about 0.1 terabytes per night. And so you can visualize this as, as being three years of operation with Meerlift will give you uh, 0.1 petabytes roughly uh, into the archive. So these are uh, big numbers, but they're not insurmountable. And so after two years of taking data with Meerkat, Thundercat has obtained about 0.1 petabytes of raw data. Of course, those need to be processed and data value extracted from, from those projects. Just to give you a perspective, there are about 270 users at IDEA Elifu working on Meerkat. And uh, more than about uh, 160 of those are based at South African Institutes. And, and more than 50% of those are students. So this is a great facility for students to work on complex, large data sets. And in order to enable that, uh, a new data pipelines have been developed, uh, both by Sureo, researchers at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, as well as researchers at IDEA and LIFU as well. Um, and there are also developments in data visualization. To extract value from data, you want to, um, to look at things in different ways. And I've got a, an animation here, which uh, is in front, uh, provided to us by research from the visualization lab at IDEA, where you can see a real three-dimensional data cube Two dimensions are the position from the sky, and the third dimension is distance. Um, and you can basically immerse yourself in these large data cubes to, to find what's in the data and to, to look at data in a different way. Um, so this, this really is very important, and these developments are happening within this uh, research data center. Similarly, developments in data fusion, where we can uh, combine complex databases and, and developments in machine learning, of course, to classify some of these dimensions. When things vary on time scales of hours, uh, we want to be able to uh, give a classification to these objects within uh, in, in near to real time so that we can effectively decide how best to follow up these objects on other telescopes. The challenge of getting rapid access to data um, is, is um, is, is being being addressed uh, quite quite efficiently. Um, so what you see here on this panel is an interface of the user through the Sareo archive. So all the data are stored in the Sareo archive. And um, this is what I would see as a user of the archive. I, I have an observation, I can push the data to IDEA, I can change the frequency uh, resolution of the data if I want to bring it in. But uh, Sareo also provides a quick loop image that, um, gives you some indication of the data quality and what's there. So uh, on the continuum image on the right, you can see an image, it gives you the, the noise of the image and you can download the bits file. And the picture on the left is a zoom in of the center of that image. And you can really see how nicely clean that image is, how well it's been reduced. And this really provides an excellent first look assessment of, of what the, um, the object is doing. So if we want to, to schedule follow-up observations, this is very helpful. The, um, this, this is a, a picture that shows you a field of view of Meerkat. This is of a black hole X-ray binary. That is a black hole accreting material from a companion star in the little box in the center. And the zoom in there shows you a time sequence. So one way to visualize transients is by splitting up the data in multiple epochs and making a little movie out of it. And you can see the source in the center there vary quite rapidly. Um, the moon is shown to scale, and this is just to indicate how wide the field of view is of these telescopes. Um, so in this particular image, we, were, we, we, we wanted to focus on the black hole in the center of the image, uh, but we found in the top left of the image uh, one of our first new radio transients. So in the, in the second animation that you see in the top left, um, in the center of that field is an, is an object that sort of blinks in and out of um, visibility. And that's, that's our first new radio transient. It turns out to be a binary star with a period of about 20 days. Um, 
but the way we don't really know that is initially from just looking at these images. So here the value of data fusion comes in. And so what I've shown you on the left is a um, the radio image in contours and red contours overlaid on the optical mirror left image. And so you see a very different uh, picture when you look in the optical. It's a dense stellar field. So we're looking through the Milky Way. But the central transient is it's associated with a very bright star in this field of view. Then in blue, you can see the optical and the, and the bright star that's associated with the radio transient. Then allows us to follow this up with some of the, uh, the telescopes in Sunderland. And we report new transients via the standards of the International Virtual Observatory Alliance. They provide uh, good guidance uh, in terms of how to report this and how to report this in, in real time. The uniformity of data processing I mentioned uh, briefly in terms of transient searches. Um, just for information, I've outlined the eight MeerKat large survey projects. And they all have very different science objectives. Some look at the pulsar timing, some look at galaxy evolution by, by looking at uh, the neutral hydrogen component in nearby galaxies or in clusters or very deep in one particular pointing. Um, and so when we want to look for transients in all these other fields, um, we have to make sure that the data that we're using are processed in a consistent way so that when we find transients and when, when we release data products in the end, we have confidence that uh, we, we probe to a similar depth or a well-defined depth, um, and we can classify these objects in a meaningful way. Um, and, and the way where IDEA and ELIF will have come in very useful is that many of these large survey projects use the same environment and platform for working with their data. And so when we search for transients in the other data, we collaborate in a very open way with data experts from all of these teams um, in this common research cloud platform. And that really allows us to avoid costly duplication of efforts of re-reducing the data, of, of um, extracting the data elsewhere. And so this is a, a great way of exploring commensal observing. Um, and, and this really is, I think, a good pathway for future collaborations towards the SKA and, um, and, and exploring commensal observing in this regard. And finally, the reliability of transient detection, and this is also all happening within the um, IDEA LUFO Research um, um, Center, is, um, is illustrated by this particular flow diagram. So I again show you the Meerkat telescope from the top and the Meerlef telescope, um, the optical telescope, and they give you two different images. So the Meerkat telescope gives you the radio image, whereas in the optical, you can see this dense star field. Now, Working with the databases that we do for Meerkat and Meerlef, uh, we have to classify variability. I showed you the movie that shows you visibility by eye, but we want to apply statistical rigor to these data sets. And so what you can expect from these light curves, from these time series of data, are statistical parameters. So the eta parameter on the plot on the left uh, is, is basically a, a reduced chi-square. So this, the source is very stable. It, it, it ends up at the bottom of the that plot, and the V parameter is a variability index. So we basically use statistical uh, parameters to look for outliers in these time series. And this MKT J object is the first radio transient that we discovered, and also in that field of view is a, a known pulsar, which both stood out as variable transients. And that then gives us confidence to issue alerts to solve and to follow up spectroscopy as well. So the data fusion, I think, is an important aspect to expect value out of, out of these data products. So I think um, trying, wrapping up in terms of our experience, lessons learned in the uh, first two years of operations of Thundercat, is the first thing I want to say is that the LIFU um, DR Research Cloud is a very effective platform to distribute and analyze these data sets amongst its users. I should emphasize that it contains experienced users, um, uh, people like Ian, Ian Haywood, who's, who's very familiar with all the data processing, processing, as well as inexperienced users, new starting students, master students, PhD students, who are unfamiliar with, with many of the ins and outs of, uh, and the complexities of radio astronomy. Um, and so from our experience, we've got 30 users on IDEA and LIFU. And we were able in, in over the last two years to rapidly um, 
assess the data, extract the science out of it, and publish the data as well. So we've got 15 papers published of meerkat data, two in nature and one in nature astronomy, and these are the high impact journals in which uh, the astronomers want to publish, as well as 24 short research notes, astronomers' telegrams, where we can instantly report what's going on. Two of the students have completed their dissertations and 13 students are ongoing. So this whole environment really facilitates a rapid turnaround of complex data sets into science results. And I also want to emphasize that this, of course, is an excellent platform for collaborations across different projects, um, bringing the uh, community, the astronomy community, uh, to the data, but also to each other, in a sense, uh, establishing similar standards across projects. So in conclusion, um, I think the Meerkat research data really shows an unprecedented depth and sensitivity. The images that Ian showed yesterday were just stunning and mind-blowing, um, but they come from very complex large data sets. And we need the, uh, the HPCs and the uh, data centers to bring the users to those structures to, to extract meaning out of those data. The data will be archived and publicly accessed as well. So the MEFAT data has a proprietary period of a year after which they become publicly available. And I want to emphasize in the idea in the environment that it's really important to bring the university community to the data and to being part of creating solutions for dealing with the large data set. Um, in terms of a legacy aspect of Thundercat, um, we're developing ways in which we can extract transients from all other surveys, turning Meerkat into a transient detection machine, and in future the square kilometer array as well. Um, there will be public data releases of light curves and a release of new transients via public alerts uh, via international standards of the uh, International Virtual Observatory Alliance. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take many questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wout, for a very interesting and um, exciting uh, presentation. There's quite a lot of information about um, how uh, data is managed. Um, and um, this, I'm sure there's a lot of learnings in this for other um, research and development initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. We have one question. Um, I could read that to you and then you can decide whether you would like to answer it live or type an answer. <clears throat> so uh, the question is, a professor vote in the long term, how do you deal with the archive of, of large data files generated from the Meerkat project? What long-term archival periods are you looking at? So, Professor, you can decide if you I'll, I'll would respond. like to ask <laughs> I'll respond verbally. I think that's the easiest. Um, so, so that's a very good question, of course. Um, so the data that are ingested into the uh, archive uh, are hosted uh, by the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, Surrey Archive. And, and those data, uh, first of all, the Meerkat telescope has a limited lifetime before it gets incorporated into the SKA. So uh, in about five or six years, the SKA project uh, will incorporate the Miller telescope. So what we're looking at the Meerkat archive, I think would, would, would be representative of a limited lifetime of science projects. And those data are currently uh, stored and ingested in a database, and those will be preserved, uh, uh, as far as I know, indefinitely. I mean, there's space to host the data on the Surrey archive. I believe it's hosted at CHPC um, in there, and the arrangement between Surrey and, and, and uh, the provider of that infrastructure to, to make the data available in the archive. The large legacy surveys also have uh, public data releases where they um, extract value from, from the data and publish uh, an annual sort of uh, sequence of light curves in our case of, or a very deep image of a particular part of the sky. And, and all of that is publicly available. Um, and, and as far as I know, that, that archive stays there for many years. Beyond that, the SKA archiving is a different matter. Uh, 
thank you very much, uh, Professor Bout. Um, our timing is perfect. It's 12.45 on the dot. Um, so, um, commendations to you for perfect timing. And thank, thank you, you for the most interesting um, uh, presentation and talk. Thank you, Anwar. Okay. So, our next presentation is from by Dr. Dale Peters and um, Mr. Nicholas Zimmer, um, and um, their presentation is entitled Trusted Digital Repository Certification with Core Trust Seal, and they will talk about the ELIFU experience from consortial collaboration to sustainable service. Um, Dr. Peters is the outgoing UCT e-research director, I have to say with a heavy heart, uh, and she's contributed significantly to the growth of support and infrastructure to both data intensive uh, research um, uh, initiatives, including that at the university. Mr. Zimmer is the management of uh, the data digital library services at UCT. And before his employment there, he worked as a digitization manager at the Center of Popular Memory at uh, UCT as well, and as an archivist as well. So with that, um, it's over to Dr. Dale Peters and Mr. Zimmer for your presentation. Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Dale Peters, and I will be presenting together with my colleague, Nicholas Zimmer. This presentation will examine the path of trusted digital repository certification as experienced by the research data management project partners of the ELIFU consortium. So let's begin with some context on how we found ourselves on this path by addressing the basic questions first like what is trusted digital repository certification? The National Institutes of Health in the United States has recognized that data sharing and reuse is a concept that's rapidly gaining ground in support of reproducible science, but cautions that researchers remain understandably wary about the quality and trustworthiness of data collected by others. They urge that to move us forward in our grand visions for big data, we must first overcome this suspicion and find ways to ensure the data we store and make available are trustworthy. There are details available on their website under data science. So why particularly the core trust seal? The Core Trust Seal is a certification based on requirements established jointly by the World Data Systems and the Data Seal of Approval. They reflect the core characteristics of trustworthy data repositories. The European Framework for Audit and Certification proposes three levels of certification for a trusted digital repository. Each has different requirements to address different needs. The three certification levels are core, extended, and formal, also referred to as bronze, silver, and gold. So to put that in context, we are talking about entry-level requirements here and a good starting point for our recently established ELIFU repositories. So why the ELIFU RDM project? Why did we become involved in this process? So at the time of the DERISA grant award in 2018 that funded the Nikki's Tier 2 data node in the Western Cape, the associated RDM project aimed for a shared data management service as a priority of the project. Working collaboratively across multiple institutions, including the University of the Western Cape, uh, CPUT, University of Stellenbosch, UCT, and Soplaki University, the project teams leveraged common policies and guidelines to support the growth of institutional services and developed shared services based on a common infrastructure across separate FigShare instances. The 
The TDR certification of the ELIFU data repositories was a requirement of the consortium agreement and was faced with some apprehension by the project partners. The process itself has been the focus of this effort and worthy of some further discussion. The initial self-assessment checklist, a template shared by the Australian Research Data Commons or ARDC, it seemed easy enough and with hindsight perhaps it was too easy as we mostly overestimated our preparedness for certification. The ARDC provide great resources online and brought together a community of practice to share experiences and documents to limit the effort for all involved in gaining core trust seal certification. And that model seemed to match our own needs quite well. The 16 formal requirements set out by the core trust seal are revised periodically and also come with helpful guidance, but it wasn't always easy to know exactly what was required. Requirements range from general organizational infrastructure to more complex issues around digital object management and technical infrastructure. We therefore sought some expert advice from Wim Hugo, previously of SEON and a member of the Core Trust Seal Board. Wim gave freely of his time and he helped us to understand the nature of the supporting documentation required for each requirement. And he sent us hunting across our institutions for relevant policies and procedures which has proved the most onerous part of this process. Wim also led some interesting discussions in the need for national support of local institutions in the practice of data curation and has been a wonderful ally in his representation of our national and specifically our ELIFU conditions. The added value of the core trust seal process is recognized by partner institutions as ELIFU research collaborations span global research infrastructures and building confidence in the services offered is considered increasingly important. It is apparent that the iterative review of procedures by an external professional is very helpful in determining the strengths and weaknesses in data curation practice and we are currently scrambling to document those practices including standard operating procedures not already covered by Figshare, which itself is ISO 27001 compliant. The Core Trust Seal is a community benchmark developed over many years of consultation and supported by the Research Data Alliance. However, the question remains whether this enormous effort and the high cost of a thousand euros per application renewable every th three years whether this high cost is the best return on investment for smaller institutions that may be obliged firstly to deliver on operational services to meet growing funder requirements. The Luifu consortium partners were able to negotiate a partial waiver of the fees based on their development of common policies and guidelines and their use of the same curatorial procedures within the Figshare platform. The biggest challenge that we currently face is the uneven development of digital preservation services across our institutions. And so here I will hand over to my colleague Nicholas Zimmer of the UCT Digital Library Services to share their use case on digital preservation. Uh, DV tapes, uh, beta cam tapes, and so on. And of course, the question was now that we have all these 
hundreds of thousands of files uh, sitting on our servers and wanting to become accessible, what do we do with them in the long term? Um, apologies, audience uh, attendees. Uh, we have a slight problem with the audio, the sound, um, and we are attending to it at the moment. And we just beg for your for your patience. Apologies for this. We'll be resolving this shortly. Perhaps while we're waiting for the problem to be solved with the presentation, I was wondering if anybody from the audience might want to suggest, submit a question or a comment. Uh, you're most welcome to use the chat interface to do this um, and the Q&A interface in particular. So if you do have any questions, uh, particularly for Dale's as, um, section of the presentation, uh, you're most welcome to please submit any questions that you might have at this point.
Once again, our apologies for this um, uh, glitch. Uh, we are working on it and we hope to uh, show the rest of the presentation in good time. Um, please um, um, uh, beg for your patience um, while we um, try to resolve this issue. Our apologies um, for this. Should I just talk uh, live to the slides? I don't know if you can hear me. The added value of the core trust seal process. Thank you, Dale. So I'd like to, in this brief middle part of our presentation, take you through uh, the history, how we got to be here uh, from the side of digital library services at UCT Libraries and some current challenges and next steps. So we became aware of the need for digital preservation, of course, uh, already many years ago as producers of data uh, in terms of our constant ongoing digitization efforts for um, particularly uh, the Special Collections Archive at the libraries, where we have become uh, experts at using all manner of hardware and software to produce a huge variety of digital files um, from lots of different leg legacy formats, such as documents, slides, cassette tapes, mini disks, uh, DV tapes, uh, Metacam tapes, and so on. And of course, the question was, now that we have all these hundreds of thousands of files uh, sitting on our servers and wanting to become accessible, what do we do with them in the long term? So some of the questions were, I know where these files are, but maybe they're in unsupported file formats or they're in a legacy system uh, or they're not so well described, so we can't really retrieve them anymore, or the files indeed have become corrupted. I'm sure all of these cases are uh, well known to everyone in the audience. Or I don't even know where the files are because they were on destroyed hardware, or a third party has them, or they're in a vault somewhere, or I expected them to be just where I left them, but they're no longer there. And of course, digital preservation uh, provides some answers to these kinds of scenarios through file format normalization, escrow, automatic metadata capture, fixity checking and virus scans, migration paths, multiple copies, search platforms, and just generally bringing data under management.
there. And of course, digital preservation uh, provides some answers to these kinds of scenarios through file format normalization, escrow, automatic metadata capture, fixity checking and virus scans, migration paths, multiple copies, search platforms, and just generally bringing data under management. Now, why is this becoming such a sort of uh, internationally important uh, topic and why is it not just the matter uh, anymore of a few niche players uh, like ourselves uh, when we started? Um, well, it obviously has to do with the data deluge in our information age where we're seeing this massive increase in digitalization in everything becoming digital right from the start. So back to the scholarly context of course preservation therefore is foundational to making data reusable um, as one can see very clearly in this uh, nice pyramid graphic uh, without having stored and then immediately preserve data, you don't even really get to say the data are accessible for any defined period of time, let alone um, comprehensible, reviewed, reproducible, reusable, um, with any sort of dependency. And of course, therefore, preservation is foundational to open science itself. Um, if there is no use made of services that safeguard the preservation and integrity of materials, uh, which does include the production of standard metadata, um, then the rest of the value chain stands on very wobbly feet. And this is really where we see the root of concepts like the FAIR guiding principles, um, where FAIR, as you all know, stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So while I can give a license to something um, and I can use open formats and I can uh, use metadata and so on, all of that really depends on the data staying where they are and staying in, in shape. So it's quite important to consider all of this in the context of the research data management life cycle, where the management, the storage, and the preservation uh, of data, of course, the, uh, affects all the other stages and is really not set, is quite inseparable uh, from all the other phases. So in order to support that uh, at University of Cape Town over the years, we've um, put together a number of different platforms um, to see that that cycle is really uh, well supported and unbroken. Uh, starting with uh, the data management planning platform UCT DMP, um, using the open source roadmap um, software uh, to support the planning and design phase through to uh, the UCT Open Science Framework as a kind of RDM dashboard uh, for the collect and capture and, and especially the collaborate and analy analyze phase. And then of course the Ziva Hub Figshare for Institutions data repository to first of all facilitate the discovery, reuse, and citation of data, but also the sharing in uh, the default uh, private uh, setting, as well as the publishing uh, of data. 
Also important to note is that there's another platform uh, in the works for the more, um, let's say, traditional uh, digital collections use case, uh, where we're making use of Omega S and Triple I F uh, for the publishing um, and the scholarly citability uh, of of scholarly outputs and, and digital collections, and of course, very importantly, now Isolo which is our digital preservation service that we're currently implementing and which also in the background um, makes sure that the data being deposited on the data repository Ziva Hub is automatically preserved. So it kind of looks like this. Uh, basically we have an integration between uh, the services Figshare for Institutions and Archivum. Uh, on the one hand, uh, branded as Ziva Hub, um, our Figshare for Institutions instance, and Isolo on the other, um, which is basically Archivematica and Atom uh, as a stable release. Uh, so everything that is published on Ziva Hub um, is preserved in Isolo. And now that that is actually happening, we can apply for the Trusted Digital Repository certification with Core Trust Seal. And of course, as Dale said, we don't know yet what the outcome will be, but with this system integration, we feel we already have at least a solid technical foundation. Now, of course, apart from the technical foundation, there is actually the much tr more tricky aspect of data governance and data management. So in Ziva Hub, we've been over the years uh, gathering a lot of experience so in the back end as curators and stewards uh, in creating lots of uh, nested groups as a kind of provenance index for um, our various stakeholders. Um, in the brand new Archivum Isolo environment, we still have a lot of questions um, because we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily working with the same kind of easily human readable index, um, but a much more um, dry interface um, that has to be ISADG compliant, um, a metadata standard uh, that assists with, um, or that is absolutely necessary uh, as defined by the Open Archival Information Systems or OAIS uh, reference model. Um, an important moment for us was World Digital Preservation Day in 2019, but also uh, especially this year. Um, it was a very interesting uh, and, of course, um, important topic, uh, Digits for Good, uh, with a reference to um, COVID-19. And this was a moment where we could actually point to the fact that we have some COVID-19 uh, re related uh, data sets and other uh, types of outputs that have already been published on Ziva Hub and indeed in the back end um, as we speak uh, these these deposits um, have successfully been um, pulled across into the um, eZolo platform. This takes us from last year where we were between somewhere stage one and stage two in terms of um, the five stages of organizational digital preservation maturity. Uh, it takes us close to stage three, uh, where we are now actually implementing ESOLO um, and the organization has committed uh, to, uh, um, to digital preservation. Of course, there are still many questions, um, so many uh, uh, changes needed to key performance uh, areas for, for, for staff, uh, new roles to be considered, uh, maybe uh, new job descriptions or job titles, and of course, uh, a new community. For us, uh, very important uh, is the growing community of data stewards and champions, together with whom we can really 
start building um, a, an institution-wide uh, network to support all the related processes um, around digital preservation at, at UCT. Thank you. Perhaps we could share some observations then in closing this, this discussion on trusted digital repository certification. The whole organization perspective, as distinct from that of discipline repositories created for the purpose of curating data on behalf of any highly specialized community, is a question that has been examined both by the consortium and by the core trust seal organization itself. And we can expect that the recognition of these two models will evolve into separate review processes in future. Our experience has affirmed the need for long-term institutional planning for data preservation as shared by Nicholas and has revealed many gaps in our current data curation practice. Invaluable too has been the mechanism of international certification and perhaps some element of scrutiny in surfacing the emergent gaps much higher on the agenda of management in our institutions. And finally, it has served to build a data curation community, working towards the same standards according to the benchmark provided by the Core Trust seal. In conclusion then, we must acknowledge that the path to trusted digital repository certification has proven to be a significant challenge and seemed quite daunting to the Elifu RDM project partners at the outset. However, given our unique opportunity for collaboration within the project and with the invaluable support from Wim Hugo, all partners are confident of timely submission as per the project timelines. We are all in agreement that the process has been a valuable learning curve in providing a sustainable data curation service irrespective of the outcome of our applications to become trusted digital repositories. Thank you very much, um, Dahil and Nicholas, for the presentation. It was certainly very, very interesting and also a good example, I think, for many other institutions in South Africa. Um, a good uh, lead for them to follow institutionally and also perhaps uh, for national organizations such as Teresa to have a look at the way in which um, one can achieve uh, trusted uh, repository certification. So thank you very much, Dale and Nicholas. And uh, my apologies once again for the few glitches that we had. Uh, makes it a little bit more exciting and memorable, I suppose, the joys of, um, of technology. Uh, there is one question, Dale, uh, directed to you, um, and I'll just very quickly read it, and then you'll respond to it, I suppose, live. So the question is, what are your highlights and lowlights in working with a consortium of universities on a LIFU project? Would you recommend future consortia to other universities? And this question is by Mr. Stempiso Makwanazi. Mm. Thanks, Anwar. And thanks, Stempiso, for the question. So the highlights were clearly the opportunity to have a discussion forum amongst people with similar responsibilities across all the institutions. Um, it served almost as a capacity building exercise for us to be able to share our expertise and also evolved into a community of practice in its own right, uh, to the extent now where partners are reluctant to let go <laughs> that the project is coming to an end and they would like to find some project to work on together in future. The low lights are obvious. Um, there wasn't much experience of working collaboratively in this way. Um, it was difficult to get partners to commit to meeting deadlines and this project had many deliverables. So yeah, that was a bit of a battle, but the, the question was really that we had responsibility for the oversight of the project, but no authority over the participants. So that was a real challenge. But I think the fact that collaborative research is the future, it's something that we all need to embrace and 
uh, learn to work in dedicated work packages for certain topics, um, structure the time and the tasks uh, more effectively. So on the whole, I think it's been very a very positive experience and I would certainly recommend it for future projects, especially where we are all learning together in, in reality. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dale, for that. Um, so we're at the end of this particular session. And once again, my thanks to everyone for um, attending, listening uh, again. Sorry about a few glitches. My thanks specifically to the presenters, uh, Dr. Peters, Mr. Zimmer and uh, Professor Vaut for your presentations. They were very, very enlightening and I'm sure quite useful for, for us as uh, exemplars of where we should go. So thank you everyone. And many thanks also to the technical people uh, for helping us out on um, and helping uh, with the presentations as well. And of course, thank you again to the attendance. And with that, uh, we are, um, I think, a few minutes into lunch and um, we'll just uh, um, have a shorter lunch, I suppose. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you.